Hello there. In the previous videos of Fractional Calculus, we have discussed primarily the grunewald letnikov derivative and the riemann liouville fractional integral. So remember that the riemann liouville operator with base point a x of order alpha of some function f of x is equal to 1 divided by gamma of alpha times the integral from a to x of x minus t to the alpha minus 1 times f of t dt. Now remember that the grunewald letnikov derivative with base points a x of alpha of f of x is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of some stuff with a summation sign in it. So in terms of analytic properties, it's very hard to use the grunewald letnikov derivative to derive any properties. Although for the numerical analysis purposes, the grunewald letnikov derivative uh, is pretty, you know, okay. So in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to use the riemann liouville fractional integral to derive a better representation for the grunewald letnikov derivative so that we can easily have a formula that can better calculate or derive some special properties of fractional derivatives. Alright, so before we start to derive this property, I just need to state some basic analytic things that must be required of this function f. So firstly, consider f to be continuously differentiable on some interval a comma b, and this a is going to be the base point, value a, and b is some point in the future, and we're going to consider f prime to be Riemann integrable on the same interval a b, right? So this is the base requirements for this function f. Um, if you don't have these, then you're not guaranteed that these properties will work. So as we already know, the riemann liouville fractional integral with base point ax of order alpha of some function f of x is equal to 1 divided by gamma of alpha multiplied by the integral from a to x of x minus t alpha minus 1 times f of t dt. Now the reason that we can't just replace alpha with a negative value is because we know the gamma function has that asymptotic behavior around each of the poles at the negative integers, right? So the gamma function, as we know, does not behave well on the negative side of the real plane. So how can we sort of you know, manipulate this representation to get something that we want. So notice that this is an integral just like any other. So what we're going to do is we're going to use u uh, integration by parts and slightly manipulate this expression. So we're going to be letting u be equal to f of t. So of course, if that is the case, that means du must be f of prime of t dt. So this is where this continuously differentiable property comes into play. So if u is equal to f of t, then that means dv must be equal to the rest of this integrand. So x minus t to the alpha minus 1 dt. So we're going to integrate this with respect to t. So that's, of course, going to be equal to negative 1 over alpha times x minus t to the power of alpha. And you can easily verify that using the power rule uh, and also the chain rule that that is the case. right? All right, so we're going to replace that integral with this uh, integration by parts representation. So the riemann liouville with base point a, x of order alpha of f of x is going to be equal to 1 divided by gamma of alpha times, so uv, so negative 1 over alpha times x minus t to the alpha times f of t. And we also need to evaluate this as uh, t goes to x and as t goes to base point a minus the integral, so uv minus the integral of v du, so that's going to be f prime of t dt, right? All right, so as t goes to x, this term is going to go to 0, so that's wonderful. Uh, and as t goes to a, this goes to f of a, and this goes to x minus a, right? So that we're going to get 1 divided by gamma of alpha times, so upper limit goes to 0. So 0 minus negative 1 over alpha times x minus a alpha f of a. So that's that term, right? 
I don't need to bracketize that. So then we have this negative negative, so that's going to be a positive. Then we have 1 over alpha times the integral from a to x of x minus t alpha f prime of d dt. All right, so let's clean this up a bit. So we have some negative signs there. So we have this is going to be equal to 1 divided by gamma alpha multiplied by, so what do we have? So we have that 1 over alpha term there. So 1 over alpha x minus a to the alpha f of a plus 1 over alpha integral a x x minus t alpha f prime of t dt. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to distribute this uh, gamma reciprocal of gamma alpha there and use the property that alpha gamma alpha is the same as gamma of alpha plus 1 which is the same as gamma of 1 plus alpha. So therefore we have I A X R L alpha of f of x is going to be equal to f of a x minus a alpha all over gamma 1 plus alpha and then plus 1 over gamma 1 plus alpha times the integral from a x x minus t alpha f prime of t dt. Now this is better than the standard RL definition for one primary reason. So we can switch alpha with negative alpha, right? So we can let alpha be equal to, say, negative p or something, right? So then we're going to get, okay, well, we know that i of minus p is the same, in terms of riemann louville is the same as the grubmont lendikov derivative evaluated at positive value p, right? So therefore, we can replace, we can generate the grubmont lendikov derivative with base point ax over order alpha. So this is going to be equal to f of a times x minus a to the minus alpha all over gamma 1 minus alpha plus, and you can see probably why I chose 1 plus alpha instead of alpha plus 1. It looks definitely a lot nicer. And then we have ax, x minus t minus alpha, f prime of t, dt. And this is the alternative representation for the grunewald lenikov derivative. Right? Now remember, for fractional integrals, we only need that alpha be between 0 and 1 for both the riemann louville and the grunewald lenikov operators because we have that a connection between the integer orders and also the fractional orders, right? So as long as alpha is in between 0 and 1, uh, our gamma function uh, definitely uh, is okay. Now keep in mind that as alpha goes to 1, uh, gamma function of 1 minus alpha is going to go to positive infinity. So keep that in mind. Uh, you should not go higher than 1 for, or including 1 uh, for this value of alpha. All right, so this is definitely a nicer analytic representation for the grunewald lenikov derivative operator. So what I want to do now is just go through an example of how to use this, you know, just a little algebraic exercise. Uh, so recall in one of our previous discussions uh, that the grunewald lenikov derivative of order 1 half with base point 0 of x of a constant was not equal to 0. In fact, it was equal to c divided by the square root of x pi. So my question to you is this. So is the grunewald lenikov derivative of 1 half 0x of gl 1 half of 0x of c, is this equal to 0? Namely, the first derivative of a constant is 0, so does this property still hold for the grunewald lenikov uh, operator? All right, so let's go through this example just to see uh, if it works out like we want. All right, so GLD0x of 1 half of C over the square root of X pi, uh, as we know, is just the same as C divided by the square root of pi times DGL1 half 0x of C, right? No, 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 where's my, that's not a function of 1 over the square root of X. There we go. 
All right, so let's work out this representation. So remember, uh, this function is not continuous at zero, right? We have a vertical asymptote. So we need to apply a limit um, in this value. So this is going to be equal to c divided by the square root of pi multiplied by the limit as a approaches zero from the right-hand side. And then we're going to apply this new representation. So we have f of a. So 1 divided by the square root of a times x minus a to the minus alpha power, so that's going to be minus 1 half, all divided by gamma of 1 minus 1 half, so that's going to be gamma of 1 half, and then plus 1 divided by gamma 1 half times the integral from a to x, and this a is still going to be limitized, uh, of x minus t to the minus alpha times the derivative with respect to t of 1 over the square root of t dt. All right? All right, so notice we have a gamma of 1 half in each of these terms, and gamma of 1 half uh, is equal to the square root of pi. So I can factor that out and multiply that by the square root of pi and just get pi on the bottom. So this is going to give me c divided by pi multiplied by the limit as a approaches 0. And I guess I should write this in a more uh, non-ambiguous manner namely the limit as a approaches 0 from the right, because it also applies to that integral, right? Of, all right, so what do we have here? So we have uh, x minus a to the minus 1 half, when we have a to the 1 half on bottom. So we can just rewrite that as 1 divided by the square root of a times x minus a, nicer form. And then plus the integral from a to x of x minus t to the minus 1 half times, so the derivative of that is just going to be minus one half t to the minus three halves dt. So let's just clean this up by factoring out this minus one half constant outside of our integral. So we're going to have c divided by pi times the limit as a approaches zero of the, from the right of one divided by the square root of a x minus a minus a minus one half of the integral from a to x of x minus t minus one half t to the minus three halves dt. Right? So this integral here uh, you should be able to do from elementary calculus. So this is going to be c divided by pi times the limit as a approaches zero from the right of one divided by the square root of a x minus a minus one half times that expression, which is going to come out to 2 divided by x. So remember, x is a constant with respect to this integral. So we have 2 over x times the square root of x minus a divided by a, and that's it. So we have some 2s that cancel, which is very nice. So this is just going to be equal to c divided by pi times the limit as a approaches 0 from the right of 1 over the square root of a x minus a. And what do we have here? So we have minus, let's see, square root of x minus a there. We have an x square root of a. All right, so as, x appro as a approaches 0, we have um, some infinities going on. So I'm going to try and get a common denominator here. Um, so I have a square root of a in both these terms. That's fine. Uh, so I'm going to multiply this one by x, and I'm going to multiply this one by the square root of x minus a. All right, that's going to give me a common denominator, I believe. Yes. So we have c divided by pi times the limit as a approaches 0 from the right of, so we have x minus, so those radicals cancel, which is very nice. So we have that, and then we have x root a root x minus a. All right, so some beautiful cancellation happens here. So their x's cancel and a turns to a positive value. So I have this is going to be equal to c divided by pi times the limit as a per zero from the row. All right, so I'm just going to rewrite this in a more algebraically nice way. Namely, the limit as a approaches zero from the right of a divided by x squared so a x minus a squared. And notice if I plug in uh, a for zero. We're going to have this in a 0 divided by 0 term. So we can apply L'Hopital's rule. All right. So this is going to be of this expression. So notice that I've factored out an x here because x is a constant with respect to a.
right? So the derivative of the top is fairly nice. So we have c divided by pi. Uh, but the derivative of the bottom is a little bit nasty, right? So we'll work that out. So we have x times, so we have 1 divided by 2 square roots of ax minus a squared multiplied by the derivative of the inside with respect to a, so x is a constant. So we have x minus 2a there, right? And then we can reciprocate this fraction to the top. So this is going to be equal to c divided by pi times the limit as a approaches 0 from the right of 2 square roots of ax minus a squared all over x times x minus 2a, right? So notice that once I distribute this here, uh, we're just going to get x squared minus 2ax on the bottom, right? So 2 square roots of ax minus a squared, right? So if I replace a with 0, that goes to 0 and the top goes to 0. So as long as x is um, real and not equal to 0, right, then this is OK. right? And remember, x being equal to 0 is definitely an issue because that's where the base point is located. right? So that means this is going to be equal to c divided by pi multiplied by 0, which is equal to 0. right? So we've proven, at least in this case, that the gruvoat lentnikov derivative of order 1 with base point 0 of x of c is equal to 0, right? Now, of course, there is one corollary uh, that I did mention before. So what if we consider the fractional differential equation uh, y0xgl of 1 half? Well, I guess I could write it in a better way. So let's solve the fractional differential equation d0xgl of 1 half of y is equal to 0. So I'm not going to give any uh, initial conditions. We'll discuss that later. So if this is the case, then we have at least one solution is equal to c divided by the square root of x pi, where c is some constant. So if I give you some initial condition, then you can find out what this constant actually is, right? Remember, just because you uh, integrate uh, 0, you don't just get a constant, especially if you have a fractional integral between 0 and 1. So keep that in mind. Also, another question, is this the only solution? So uniqueness. So we're not discussing the FDEs here. We'll leave that to a later time. But this at least uh, gives us another representation for the grunewald lenikov derivative, which allows us to calculate fractional derivatives of a variety of functions without having to worry about infinite series and limits. Hope you